All right, guys, let's get started. So, a couple logistical things. Hopefully, you have all turned in your programming assignment two by now, since it was due on Monday. If you haven't, you should probably do it sooner rather than later. If you think you've, there's still at least ten. So, there's at least ten people that haven't turned it in. There are three recitations. So that means, on average, at least three people in this recitation haven't turned it in. So, if you all think you've turned it in. You should probably get online and double check. It is unfortunately easy in the wonderful Moodle interface, such that you could upload the file and then forget to click the last button and it might not actually get uploaded. So take a moment to confirm that you've actually turned it in. You wouldn't want to show me a grading session and realize that you don't have a copy of it and now you're 10 days late, right? Um, if you know you haven't turned it in, then you just need to turn it in, period. So get it turned in. If you haven't scheduled a grading session already, you might be kind of screwed. Uh, I don't know if there are any grading <laughs> sessions left, but you should at least email us and beg for mercy. Um, did you know add some more next week? He canceled his grading sessions for like 10 people or something. Oh, and then rescheduled them all next week? Mm -hmm. Didn't know that. Um, well, so if you had a grading session canceled, you should probably reschedule next week. Um, <laughs> If for some reason you have no longer his new sessions don't fit into your schedule, send us an email. We'll work to accommodate that. Um, but if you've just been lazy and you haven't scheduled a grading session, then you definitely need to contact us so we can get that worked out. If you have scheduled a grading session, show up to it. Uh, don't stand us up. You'll lose some points, and, and then you'll have to try to figure out how you're going to schedule another grading session. So that's all I'm going to say on that point. Show up. Turn your stuff in. You're all, what, not freshmen anymore, so you should be able to pull this off. There aren't any freshmen in here, are there? Okay, in other news, your next assignment is not a programming assignment, it's a problem set. It's problem set two, it's due a week from today. You can either turn in in person during your recitation, or you can turn in online, scan, and convert it to a PDF by 11.55 that evening. So. You get a few extra hours if you want to scan and convert it to a PDF, but if you just want to turn it a physical copy, do it in recitation. It's a lot of problems that involve various sides of basically concurrency and protection semantics. So mutexes, semaphores, concurrent operations, readers, writers. <coughs> a lot of this I've been talking about, some more of the stuff that we're going to touch on. Uh, a lot of these are more or less problems out of your textbook. So assuming you've been following the lectures in your textbook, you should be more than equipped to answer most of these. You have it was released on Monday, you had a week and a half then, now you have a week. So get it done by next Wednesday. Looking ahead a little bit, uh, after this assignment, there'll be one more problem set. That's going to get released next Wednesday. It'll then be due, not the Friday two days after that, but the Friday a week and two days after that. The Tuesday after that's your midterm. Uh, and I don't know if Professor Hahn said anything about this yet. If not, I'm sure he will soon. Uh, but your midterm's essentially two weeks from yesterday. Uh, is the midterm for this class. So that midterm is then one full week. There's that midterm week, and then one more week of school, and then you're on spring break. There'll be one more programming assignment that will go out that Monday before the midterm. It's due the Friday before spring break. So you have just shy of two weeks to do it, and the midterm is, takes out one day of those two weeks, but it's the first day. So. How many programming assignments in, program, er, in problem sets are there total? Five and five? I think five and five is going to be the plan. Um, so this will be your third programming assignment when we get back from break. There will be two more programming assignments and two more problem sets. Uh, is the plan as it stands now. We reserve the right to change that whenever we feel like. Um, worst case, there would be six programming assignments, which would probably mean we only do four problem sets. But the status quo will be five to five. Any other questions? Okay. Well, that's your look ahead. The immediate concern is problem set to get it done by this time next week. What we're going to be looking at today is a couple of things. We're going to start out by looking at semaphores, really, because we haven't we've been doing a lot of talking about the actual implementation of mutexes. Hopefully, you guys have seen semaphores in the textbook and via Professor Hong's lectures. But today we're actually going to look at writing a program that uses semaphores. And what we're going to look at is essentially writing the same program we wrote last week, but this time we're going to use semaphores and we're going to have a buffer that's bigger than size one. So 
differ from a mutex. I mean, we've said we have this some kind of a concept of counting associated with it. It's used for ordering. It's what? Used for ordering. Uh, okay. When you, can, when you do threads, the order you do threads. So what do you mean it's used for the order? So if, if, if thread, if you want thread two to come after thread one, you could use seven fours to make sure thread two executes after thread one. So if we're using mutexes and we have three different objects all locked the mutex, which one's going to get it when the mutex becomes available? So three, three, three threads are waiting on a mutex. Who, who gets it? It's not by the schedule. It's, so it's undefined on mutexes. Any one of them could get it. Generally, that's not true on semaphores. Semaphores have some concept of ordering. They essentially have an internal queue such that the first item to request a semaphore and for the course to wait is then the first item that gets it when it becomes available. So if a semaphore basically has a concept of a line, right? If five people get in line for a resource, the first one's going to get it. Mutexes are more of the mad mob, right? It's whoever happens to be in the right place at the right time when it becomes available is who gets it. In many ways, I mean, semaphores are used in a lot of the same concept uh, that we use mutexes for. They're mainly used to protect things, to coordinate programs in multi-threaded or multi-process environments. Unlike a mutex, they have these two things. A mutex is binary. A semaphore can is of order n, right? You can check out a semaphore. You can find a semaphore such that you can check out by more than one person before it blocks. So that we check out in times before it blocks. The other thing, like we just touched on, there is an enforced order. Uh, this is a little bit of a but generally, when we talk about a semaphore, we're acknowledging there's an enforced order that the semaphore will be released if people are waiting on it. So, when we deal with semaphores in textbooks and the literature, you generally deal with two main operations and then two kind of supporting operations that you have to deal with semaphores. Obviously, there's an init operation. This does just what you would expect. It's what you call, I mean, this is what you have to do to make the semaphore start working. Often you can feed this some initial value for the semaphore as well. Um, with the init, there's generally a destroy. So these are your supporting functions. They're just, you have to call one to make the semaphore usable. You have to call another one to free up any memory that the semaphore may have needed, so on and so forth. Those are kind of your two core semaphore support functions. Your semaphore operations, which is what you mainly see in the literature, uh, get referred to in a number of ways, and the most common way you see them is with the ever clear P and B. So you have two operations, one's called B, they both operate on a semaphore. You have a second operation called B, also on a semaphore. Where these two operations mean nothing that has to do with their first letters. Uh, that's actually not strictly true. The P operation is essentially the decrement or decrement weight operation, right? This is the one that will decrease the value. It, it checks out the semaphore. So this is, um, right off the edge of my camera. but this is decrement, which also has the ability to lock. If there are no available copies of the thing, copies is the wrong word, but if you, the semaphore has been decremented so many times such that it's essentially depleted, this will then lock until it becomes available. The V operator is then the opposite. It's an increment. The increment can never block. The increment will just always increment. Uh, the way semaphores are normally implemented are there is an integer value essentially associated with them. When that integer value is positive, P will decrement and not block. When the integer value is equal to zero, P will block until it's not zero, then it will decrement it and. So people kind of clear on these core operations. The reason we call them P and V is we can thank the good Mr. 
Dijkstra, relevant computer scientist who you will encounter at other points in your careers, uh, but he was Dutch. Which means that he refers to them as the B operator and the P operator because this happens to be the Danish word for decrement and, or this happens to be the Danish word for increment, the P operator happens to be the Danish word for increment. Yeah, for increment. So, decrement. <laughs> the P operator decrements, the V operator increments. Uh, we stick with the syntax even though it doesn't mean anything about anything in English, but that's just the way these things go when you're famous and you're from another country. It can be a little bit of, I mean, I think we probably get plenty of ethnocentrism being Americans and English speakers. Maybe for once we can see how the rest of the world feels when we start doing computer science stuff based upon our own language, right? Um, so, that's the way you'll see it in the texts. You will sometimes also see this, uh, I mean, there are a number of names for these, P and V, decrement and increment. You will see them as weight and signal sometimes, where this is the weight and this is the signal. All kinds of different things. When you're looking at kind of like formal semantics and computer science papers, it's almost always the thing you you see. Now, I guess I should have left the screen down. So the question is, how do we use these in our program? Unlike mutexes, which are part of the pthread library, semaphores are actually part of a separate POSX library. You have to include another header file, but if we just do and sim, we'll get a nice listing of pretty much all the available semaphore operators we have. So you can kind of see some of the core operators we've talked about in here. We have a sim init, that is for initializing our semaphore. We have a sim destroy for destroying our semaphore. The question then is, which of these corresponds to the P operator and which corresponds to the V operator? And, you know, just to make your life easy, the V operator is sim host, which starts with a P. Uh, so, we've lost it here, but in terms of POSIX semantics, the V semaphore operator is what we call sim host, and the P is what we call sim wait. So, there's 10,000 names for these things. I apologize. It's one of those things you just have to deal with. When you're writing your program, you'll refer to them as SimPost and SimWait. When you're writing the paper about your program, you'll refer to them as B and P. So let's take a look at where we might want to use them, of course. Um, So last week we dealt with a problem that was essentially a producer-consumer problem with a bounded buffer in between, some kind of a buffer that last week was size only of one, but that wouldn't stop you from writing to it. You could overwrite that one item in it. This week we're going to look at that same problem, only now we're going to have a buffer with a size greater than one. So this has some size n. We have some producer, which puts items on the buffer. We have some consumer which removes items from the buffer. Where the buffer is circular, if the producer keeps writing and the consumer never reads, it'll just keep writing over the buffer over and over again, and you'll essentially end up losing data. So like last week, we have to assume that at some point, if the buffer <coughs> fills up before it gets read, the producer has to stop until the consumer gets a chance to pull some of this stuff off the buffer, then the producer can continue, so on and so forth. Unlike last week, the buffer is greater than the size of one. So a mutex isn't necessarily the right way to protect it anymore. So let's go ahead and look at a version of this program that doesn't do any protection, which will kind of be the equivalent of the one that didn't protect anything last week. So this should look familiar. Essentially the same code we were looking at last week. Uh, we've defined one additional variable. We have this buffer size now. We're just defining it to five, but essentially this is the size max size of our buffer at any given time. Unlike the queue in your most recent programming assignment, this is a buffer. It has no concept of being full or empty. If it's full and you keep writing to it, it'll just overwrite. So it's a circular buffer. This is the way a lot of buffers behave. The way I implemented it is actually a LIFO buffer, last in, first out. So it kind of works like a stack. The most recently thing, the most recent thing written to the buffer is the first thing to come off of it. Um, you can do the same thing with a FIFO buffer, but 
a life for T0 tau. If we actually look at the buffer struct itself, it's now instead of having just a single B, we now have an array of ints inside of it, and we have a count that basically just keeps track of where we are in this array. We're going to pass to our structs a single argument this week. Last week we had it as two sets of arguments, but as we discussed, you don't really need you didn't really need two sets of arguments. This week I'm acknowledging that you don't need two sets of arguments. We're just going to have one struct. It's going to hold our common data, which in this case is just the buffer, and then that struct is what's going to get passed to both our producer and our consumer thread. Our init buffer pretty much does the same thing, only it also sets all of the values in this array equal to some initial value. Our put buffer just puts the current value, puts whatever value you pass to it at the current location on the buffer, and then has some logic to essentially rolling back around to zero when you get over the buffer size. The get buffer does the same thing in reverse, pulls up whatever the most recent item on the buffer was back off and returns it to you, and then also has some logic for essentially rolling around. If it goes below zero, it needs to roll back up to the buffer size. People okay on this? We have our thread functions. They do pretty much the naive version of what we did last week. They go through num cycles times. The producer thread just puts numbers, integers onto the buffer where the integer corresponds to the current loop iteration. So these are these 0 to 9. And then it also prints it the screen just for our benefit. Consumer does the exact opposite. Reads through num cycles, grabs whatever's on the buffer off, prints it to the screen. Our thread then sets up handles for our main, then sets up handles for both of our threads, sets up a copy of our arguments, sets up a copy of our buffer, initializes our buffer, and assigns the reference inside the arguments to that buffer. Creates both of our threads, passing them the function names and then the arguments we want, waits on both of our threads, and then exits. People okay with this? It really is pretty much identical to the naive solution from last week. So because we don't actually protect this buffer, we have a buffer of size five and we're writing 10 objects to it. So we would kind of expect when we run this, I mean, there's an infinite, well, not an infinite, but there is a large number of scenarios that could occur. The most common scenarios are either the consumer thread ones first, it's gonna pull 10 negative ones off the buffer, and then the producer thread's gonna go and write everything to the buffer, right? That's one possible outcome of the program as it's written out. The other would be the opposite happening. The producer thread runs first. In which case, the producer thread is going to write 10 items to the buffer, the last five of which are going to overwrite the first five, because there's only five spots on the buffer. The consumer will then run, it's going to pull 10 items, but it's just going to pull the same five items twice, because the buffer is only size five. So it's basically going to go through the buffer twice, you'll get two copies of the last five and no copies of the first five. So if we go ahead and compile this, We'll essentially see that. So this looks like the case where our producer ran first. Our producer puts all nine items onto the buffer. The consumer then starts reading items off the buffer, but it reads 98765 and then 98765. Because the buffer is filled with those five values, that's all it can hold. So the consumer is just going to read them over and over again. We run it a couple of times. OK, so here we get the opposite case. That worked out nicely. So the consumer runs first. In this case, it gets negative 1 10 times. Then the producer puts everything onto the buffer. So a behavior, clearly not the behavior that we want. So let's look at fixing this using a semaphore. So the semaphore-based solution to this looks a lot like the last solution we looked at last week that uses two mutexes to basically force the producer and consumer to alternate. We're going to do the same thing with semaphores, only instead of forcing them to alternate one after the other, we kind of have this buffer size now that they can grow by. We just have to make sure that it's balanced. For every five writes to the buffer, we need to have at least one cons consumption before we do another one write to the buffer, so on and so forth. Um, so let's go ahead and pull up the code for that. So this code should look the same thing that we were looking at last time. I should turn these up from the last class. We'll turn them back down again. <coughs> 
So we'll make our buffer size 5, just like it was before. We'll run 10 iterations. Uh, we set up our buffer exactly the same, but now to our struct, we've added two new semaphores. These semaphores take this SIMT type. They're both pointers to these SIMTs. We're following one SIM available and one SIM filled. Like I noted, you have to include this extra .h file when you're using POSX semaphores. That's just where they're stored. So we now have a SIM available and a SIM filled. Anyone want to wager a guess as to what we're going to be using each one for? Based off their names, what would you expect SIM available does? Okay, so maybe we're using this semaphore to track the number of available spots on the queue. Where what do we define as an available spot? A spot that has either never been written to or has been read. One of the two. Um, sem filled then represents what? Has been written to but not read. The other side of it. This is how many items we've written to the buffer but have not been read. So by using both of these, when we're going to initialize, when we go to initialize all this down below, what would be the correct initial value for some available? When the program first starts, five. buffer size, or five in our case, what would be the correct initial value for some filled? Zero. 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 Right. So this is kind of the equivalent to starting out one of our mutexes locked and one unlocked that we looked at last week when we were just trying to get them to alternate. Um, What's the max sim filled will ever be equal to, assuming our program's working? Buffer size. Buffer size with five, and then what's the min sim available will ever be? Zero. Yeah, and that's true across the board. A semaphore will, the min for any semaphore is always zero. Uh, it blocks, if it, if it can't decrement below zero, it'll block, wait till it's above zero, and then decrement back to zero. So, it's kind of a trick question. The min of a semaphore is always zero. So, we go through, we initialize, the buffer functions haven't changed, they're identical. But our producer and consumer functions have changed a little bit. We'll come back to it. If we get down to main, and look at this, we still have our two thread handles, we have our thread arguments, we have our buffer, but now we have two semaphores affiliated with this. Like we said, we need to call this sim init function. I can't return an error, so that's what we're catching here. To the sim init, we basically pass a pointer to one of these semaphores. We then pass this signal variable here where this is defined as if it's zero, this is a semaphore we're going to use between threads. If it's non-zero, this is a semaphore that might be used between threads and processes. Now, that's how the POSX standard works. In Linux, it's only implemented for threads. So if you do anything other than zero here, it won't work. But this is part of the wider POSX standard that comes with more than just Linux. In theory, you could use semaphores also to coordinate between processes, in which case you would use a non-zero value here. For your case, using this with threads, it'll always be zero. We can then pass an initial value. So like we said, our initial value for the sim available is going to be buffer size. We then do the same thing with our sim filled, only its initial value is going to be zero. People okay? We then set up references in our thread args, both the sim available and sim filled. We initialize our buffer just like before and set up a reference to it in our thread args as well. We spawn both of our threads, passing them our thread args. We then wait on both of our threads. We have to remember to destroy our semaphores. It's a memory leak if you don't. So this is like closing files or all that other stuff. We initialize them, we have to destroy them, and then we exit. So if we look at the actual changes we've made to the producer and consumer functions, looks a lot like before, only now, before we can write, we have to verify that there is a spot available in our queue, that there is an unused spot in our queue. We do that by calling sim wait. So again, this is the equivalent to that T operator in more formal semantics. But sim wait, we're going to pass it to sim available. What this is going to do is the first time this runs, sim available is going to be 5. This will work just fine. It's going to decrement that 5 to a 4. It's then going to continue. Um, when this gets down to the point where that can't be decremented any further, it's going to block right here until something adds post to that sim before, which is still then allowed to continue. We do the same buffer put that we did before, but then we're done. We've now added one item to the buffer. We have to update our sim filled to reflect the fact that the buffer now has a new item that can be read. So we start by decrementing our sim available. We end by incrementing our sim filled. The consumer then does the opposite of this. 
it starts by making sure that there's something on the queue for it to consume. It's going to initially would just wait because it starts out at zero, but as soon as the producer pushes an item, it's going to call send post. This send field is going to get incremented to one. This will then allow this to decrement itself back to zero and continue. At the end, it's now just pulled an item off the queue. That means that there's one more space available. So it's going to now increment our sim available, so on and so forth. So the combination of both these semaphores is essentially allowing both of our producer, both our producer and our consumer to ensure that they're never going to exceed the size of the queue. That every write to the queue will be answered by a corresponding read. It might not be perfect alternation. In theory, you can go in blocks of five, right? You could have five writes, five reads, five writes, five reads. In the worst case, it would be one write, one read, one write, one read. It could be anything. Just out of curiosity, how would you handle uh, trying to do it with an arbitrary number of cycles? Like not defined before the final time? With an arbitrary number of? Cycles. So let's say you're going to read and write integers like you're doing, but. So like with an arbitrary buffer size? No, so like you don't know. So going in for each run, it could be 10 numbers this time or four numbers this time. Do you want to read and write to your buffer? Read and write to a read from your buffer? So, I mean, you would essentially, what you could do, I mean, so normally the way you would do this is you would read until your buffer was empty and you would write until it was full, right? Uh -huh. So instead of having this run for some number of cycles, I mean, or often what you want, you, you have some other exit condition, right? So if this is like a packet buffer on a net, in a network program or something, this is just going to keep pulling for the life of the program, probably, or until someone sends your program the exit command. So this num cycles is irrelevant. This is just to give us an easy, it's just to give us a defined exit condition, right? We could we could make this an infinite loop. This program would run forever, just constantly expanding and contracting on this buffer, and it would work fine. Um, it doesn't really do anything, right? So there's no logical exit condition, which is why we have this num cycles in post. But in the context of real life, you would have some exit condition. You want to keep listening to this buffer essentially until you don't. And when you don't, it's when you get the next state. Okay. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Okay. Anything else? So if we go ahead and watch this run now, we'll go ahead and compile it. And now we'll go ahead and run it. Yeah, less. And we kind of see that behavior we talked about. So again, we can't predict exactly where they're going to go in, but the consumer starts, but it then immediately blocks because we start out with nothing and that sim field starts out at zero. So then our producer gets a chance to run. Our producer manages to put five items so it fills up the buffer. The consumer then is going to grab all five items off the buffer. The buffer is now empty. That's going to force it to go back to the producer. The producer is now going to put another five items the consumer is then going to grab those five items. So kind of running on blocks of five, if we do this, I actually couldn't get it to do a different order in the other class. Uh, the scheduler on this machine is fairly robust. Here we go. So now we're looking at the case where maybe it's the other side, it's alternating every time, which is another fair solution to this problem, right? So it could alternate every time, it could alternate blocks of five, or it could be anywhere in between. If we up this, so we do it on a much bigger size, say we have 1,000 cycles and a buffer size of 10. And out again. We now see that, I mean, we're kind of getting bigger versions of that same behavior. Block of 10, another block of 10. I mean, it's going to go on forever, but essentially it's ensuring that every item that's generated eventually gets consumed. We're not ever overwriting any of our data at any points. This really does like one block of five and then another block of five on this machine. On the other machine I run it on, it always tends to alternate correctly. So on and so forth. So that's kind of your semaphore-based solution to your producer-consumer problem, uh, which is why I looked at this week, why I looked at last week. We're now probably done looking at Problems. So if you're tired of it, great. Um, semaphores can be used in place of mutexes. A mutex is just a semaphore with size equal to one, effectively. Uh, 
yeah, it has a queue and stuff behind it, but that doesn't really matter from, from uh, using it in terms of a mutex standpoint. So you can use a semaphore as a replacement for a mutex, and you would just set a size equal to one. You can also, if your honest system doesn't have semaphores, you can build semaphores using mutexes, where you can essentially use mutexes to protect an integer and then increment and decrement that integer at certain times. So you can implement semaphores using mutexes, and you can replace mutexes using semaphores. So they tend to be pretty interchangeable. It's more a matter of whatever's convenient for the given problem is normally what you use. It's whatever's convenient or whatever's available. Sometimes only one or the other will be available. Sometimes they'll both be available. In which case, it's whatever happens to be most convenient. Questions on semaphores? Did you need two semaphores in that last example? Yes. Okay. I'm because little. of the way the buffer, because it's a circular buffer like that, and you have to keep track of, I mean, there's essentially, the, you're keeping track of two bounds. You can either have a buffer that has nothing on it, and you don't want the consumer to read from it, so that requires one semaphore, or you can have a buffer that's full, and you don't want the producer to write to it, that requires another semaphore. So it's because it's a problem that's bounded on both sides that you need to. Okay. There might be, There might be a solution that uses one. I'm not thinking on top of my head, though. I just felt like sometimes you can get more clever. One semaphore was like a function of the buffer size, and the other <coughs> semaphore. If that makes sense. Right, but again, that would only protect in one direction, right? It would keep you from ever filling your buffer. But if your buffer is empty, it's not going to stop you because because semaphores will increment forever, right? You can keep doing a sim push for so they only block in one direction, which is why you kind of need two to limit on both sides. Any other questions? Okay, so now we're going to spend the rest of our time looking at some of these kind of more formal problems. So, you'll see some of this on your homework and just coming up in, on things like tests and stuff like that, but there tend to be three or four kind of standard textbook go-to um, concurrency and coordination problems that we deal with, and you can fit a bunch of other problems into that. The one we've been talking about a lot is the producer-consumer problem, where what we just looked at was the producer-consumer problem, what we looked at last week was the type of producer-consumer problem. In some ways, the queue that you guys used on your most recent program is a type of producer-consumer problem. It was a little bit simpler because it protected its limits on its own. It wouldn't let you write if it was full and it wouldn't let you pull if it was empty, but it was still a producer-consumer at one level. Uh, the way a producer-consumer works is you essentially, it has some common resource, and then in addition to the common resource, it has the concept that only of exclusive access. So. Be they producers or consumers, only one item can be accessing this at a time. That's pretty typical, can be accessing the at a time. That's pretty typical producer-consumer problem. Now there's a second type of problem, which we're going to be talking about some today, called the reader's writer's problem, which you guys have probably seen in the lecture, but we're going to go over it in a little more detail. Where the reader's writer's problem also has some common resource. But where it differs in how it handles exclusive access. Whereas this, only one item can be accessing at a time, regardless of what kind of item it is, producer or consumer. In the reader's writer's problem, we actually separate them by classes. We say that if a writer is accessing, it can be the only thing accessing it. So it's exclusive, but only to writers. So only one writer can access it at a time. If a writer is accessing it, nothing can read it. But for readers, you can have as many as you want. As long as nothing's writing to it, if you're only reading from it, you can have 10 things all reading from it in parallel. So this is what we're going to talk about today, but it's a little bit more complex in the fact that we have two different classes of entities that are accessing, and we have different enforcement rules for each class. For the writer, it has to be exclusive, but for the reader, as long as it's not being written to, we can have as many readers as we want. This is pretty common in things like files. You don't, if you're reading a file, you don't care how many things are reading it. They're not going to interact with each other. They're not going to affect each other. That's fine. If something's writing it, you don't want two writers at the same time because they're going to leave, and you don't want anything reading it while it's being written because it might get partial data. 
But as long as it's only being read, you can have as many uh, you can have as many people reading it simultaneously as you like. So the problem, the other kind of classic problem in this set would then be like the dining philosophers or some of these classes of deadlock type problems. This is a place it really needs. Um, but we'll get to that next week. Today we're going to spend some time talking about readers writers problem and various solutions to it. So maybe we may not even get to the solution, but we'll get to at least definitions. So stop me if you feel like I'm being overly repetitive when you have a class, but there tend to be two types of readers writers problems we talk about, sometimes a third. They are called the first readers writers problem and the second readers writers problem. So the way the first reader's writer's problem works, you can also sometimes call this reader's precedence, but the way the first reader's writer's problems work is, and it's easier to draw than explain, something like this. So assume we have three readers. We'll call them R1, R2, and R3. And say we just have one writer. We'll just call it W for now. This is, again, a time diagram. We'll pretend like where a solid line means that that, acts, that uh, thread is currently utilizing the resource. A dotted line means that thread is currently waiting to use the resource, right? So in the first reader's writer's problem, um, and I guess we should define what we mean, they're called the reader's writer's problems. This is actually kind of the solution we're looking for. The problem is, how do you implement a program that allows multiple readers on one writer? That's the problem from the reader's writer's problem. Now, the solution has its own problems, but that's not what we mean when we say reader's writer's problem. You'll see what I mean in a second. Um, so in the solution to the first reader's writer's problem, or I guess in the first solution to the reader's writer's problem, we'll have three readers, we'll have one writer, and we'll implement a solution such that the writer just has to, a writer cannot start until all readers have finished. So in this kind of a paradigm, we can have reader one reading, it might be reading right here, maybe reading two, reader two starts reading right here, reads till here, maybe maybe then the writer comes along and it says, well, I want to start reading right now, but the writer's going to get blocked because something's already reading, so we can't go read. So it's going to block. The third reader can come along right here, continue to go, and the writer just has to keep waiting. If the first one comes back here, so on and so forth, the writer keeps waiting until it just so happens that no readers want it at all, right? So that's why we call this reader's precedence. The readers, even after a writer has requested a write, these readers can kind of keep doing whatever they want until all of them stop, and that'll be the first opportunity the writer gets to start. So let's say this one didn't come back, in which case the writer wouldn't start writing until right here. So this has the potential to starve your writers. So it's, it's the solution to the first reader's writer's problem, but the solution itself has a problem. And that's there are situations where the writer is going to get started forever. This is a fine. The, the solution we'll look at, the solution that implements this behavior, is fine as long as you know you're not. It's fine in read sparse environments, right? So if you're only going to be reading every now and then, this is a fine solution because the probability of just having this kind of cyclic, if there's always something trying to read, which is what would start your writer, just won't happen. In a situation where you know you're going to be trying to read all the time, this is probably not the best solution because of that starvation issue. So then we look at what's called the second solution to the reader's writer's problem. Where the change to the second solution is that as soon as a writer, we add one more rule, which is basically this is all the same. If reader one's reading, it's good. If reader two comes and starts to read, all your runs still reading, it can read at the same time. But as soon as a writer makes a request to write, we're no longer going to allow any readers to start. So before we had a request to read right here, but we've already had a request to write before it. So that means we're now going to block this reader. That'll ensure that as soon as this read's done, our writer can now start sooner, right? Our writer can start right here. It avoids the issue of basically, as long as each reader individually will finish, it avoids the starvation issue. Because as soon as a request to write, you're going to not let any more readers start eventually the readers that are already going will finish and you'll be allowed to write. That's not true in the first reader's writer's problem where even if you can guarantee every reader finishes, that doesn't prevent starvation. 
because although they might individually finish, they could all just keep starting again before the last one's finished, essentially forming this cycle of graph. So in the second reader's writer's problem, you add a rule that basically says, as soon as a writer makes a request, no other readers are allowed to start until that request is satisfied, then this reader could actually start reading, so on and so forth. So this is called writer's presence, and it's the second solution to the reader's writer's problem. Now, it has the opposite problem. In this situation, if you had a bunch of writers, so say we have two writers, you could effectively, so only one thing would be writing at a time, so they can't overlap, but you could effectively ensure that you're never going to get to read by just keeping to alternate between these two writers, you could start your readers. So again, has the opposite problem. Um, it's still a solution to the wider reader writer problem. It allows multiple reads while only enforcing one write at a time, but it doesn't necessarily solve all the starvation issues. There's a third solution to the reader writer's problem that kind of tries to force these things to alternate. We're not really going to talk about it. It tends to be seen less regularly. Um, but in reality, you can kind of never guarantee an end of starvation. No matter what solution you pick, even one that tries to alternate, one of these could always go and write forever, go and read forever, which would effectively block everything else. So when we talk about the first and second reader writer's problems, that's kind of what we're talking about. Uh, those are the two problems that we are talking about, kind of. Um, I'm going to pull it up on the projector and set it on the board real quick because we're running out of time. If you go on Wikipedia, you can find a nice solution to the second reader's writer's problem. What we're going to look at is essentially a solution to the first reader's writer's problem real quick. It's great too because this is always the class I film, right? So there's tons of footage of me not being able to pull down the projector. <laughs> really drives up my YouTube ratings. All right. Um, I'm sorry, this is a poorly designed website. Can people, this is too small for people to read. Fine. Okay, I can make it bigger if necessary. But this is kind of the textbook solution to the first reader's writer's problem. So again, the way we're going to solve this is we're going to use two semaphores, uh, although these are, these are actually binary semaphores, so you could also use mutexes, right? Mutexes are semaphores in this case. They only have one value. And in addition to these two, we're going to use this variable called inReaders, where essentially this is just an integer that's going to keep track of the number of active readers at any given time. So we have two mutexes, and we have this integer that keeps track of the number of readers. Essentially, one of these mutexes it's just to protect this variable. It's to ensure that no two things try to update this variable at once. The second mutex is then the writer one that controls whether or not there's a writer currently active or prevents a writer from going active, so on and so forth. So we have some pseudocode up here that uh, essentially we want to look at. Okay. So we want to look at the C++ implementation. This is just the pseudocode implementation. So we start out with these two semaphores. We start with this in num readers. We then have our reader's code. So again, we're going to have reader's code, we're going to have writer's code. This is what you hand off to each of your friends. In the reader's code, the first thing we're going to do is we lock this sim reader's mutex. So this is essentially the mutex that protects our in readers variable. We're then going to go in, and every time we spawn a new reader, we're going to essentially add one to this in readers variable, right? So this is a counter that counts how many active readers. We're going to add one. Any time that in readers variable goes from zero to one, so as soon as the first, this is only going to run when the first reader activates, it's going to go ahead and lock that sim writer's mutex. So the first reader grabs the writer's lock. That's going to ensure that there are no writers that can join while that while at least one or more readers is active, right? People okay with this? We then go ahead and release our sim readers because we're done updating this, so we don't need it. We then do our read of the database. When we're done reading the database, we check out that mutex again. Again, that's just protecting this variable. We decrement the variable. When we decrement it to zero, so essentially when the last reader finishes, it's then going to release the writer's lock. So the first, or the job of the first reader is to grab the writer's lock. We can then have as many readers as we want come in and start reading, so on and so forth. When the last reader leaves, it's going to remove. It's going to let go of the writer's lock. It's kind of like the last man out turns the light off solution to this problem, right? 
So the first person in turns the light on, he grabs the lock that then prevents any writers from doing anything. The last reader to leave releases that lock, which will then allow writers to do the thing. The writing then is very simple. All it does is it grabs its lock, it writes, and then it releases its lock. But this will effectively mean that as long as, so this will block both in the case where there's another writer, because another writer will have grabbed the rock, it'll also block in the case where there's more, one or more readers, because the first reader would have grabbed that lock and it won't be released until the last reader exits. So it's a little bit more complex than the stuff we've been looking at before, because we kind of do have to add this extra variable uh, in order to impose this concept of there's different rules for writers than there are for readers. So the second reader's writer's problem, like I said, you can look it up online, we're not going to get to it. It kind of builds on this solution, but imposes an extra rule about whether or not one of these you basically have to add in their new text to keep track of whether or not this has been requested, and then you prevent any new ones of these from being spawned, and so on and so forth. Questions on that? So there's a homework problem that talks about this. I mean, again, it's a textbook problem. It's in your textbook. Uh, this is the kind of stuff that might come up on the midterm, but you should understand what the first reader's writer's problem is, what the second reader's writer's problem is, and you should kind of know the basic solutions to both. Next week, we may talk about dining philosophers, which is kind of another common problem in this scheme. But that's all I have for now. I will post a link to this later, as well as the code we looked at today. Make sure you attend your grading session. You have problems to do this time next week. Thanks. Thank you.